keynote speaker. He's a faculty in the Department of Rehabilitation Psychology and um, incredible teacher. So I can't think of anybody more perfect to come and speak to you about teaching and learning and classroom experience than um, Dr. Shan, who is Kylie, going to be on sabbatical next year, but <laughs> Kylie taking the time to come and talk to you all today before he takes off and I won't see him for a whole year. Yeah, but um, so if you can help me welcome Dr. Shan. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat informal today, and so I'm not going to show you any PowerPoint, but I would want to share with you some of my thinking about uh, what I gained uh, as a TA or research assistant or project assistant 33 years ago when I was also a doctoral student here. Uh, so I've been a professor 30 years. I get my degree from here, and of course I'm biased about Wisconsin. Uh, but. 30 some years ago, no one tried to help me link uh, between my job and what I need to use that learning experience to help me uh, launch my career. And so today I want to help you guys will be to start early, to think about what will be your target behavior four years from now or five years from now when you go look for a job. And how do you use this experience to help you get the job you want? And also how to use this experience to make you a better professor and have a beautiful career for another 30 years, just like what I have, okay? So, so basically that's what I want to achieve today, but in a very somewhat informal way, okay? Uh, and then in addition, I want to actually bring in a little bit about uh, race, ethnicity, and diversity into the formula. The reason is actually, uh, if you look at, say, the census uh, statistics, uh, when they project out in 2050, that uh, the United States will become a lot more diverse. Uh, and the uh, white or European American race will be about 48%, and the minority will become about 52%. So therefore, when you become a professor, the world will change a little bit, that you're going to run a classroom, or you're going to mentor your master's students or PhD students that are going to be a lot more diverse. And therefore, there will be some kind of interesting dynamic there that for the minority professors and also for the majority professors. And we want to be aware of that issue but at the same time, we want to use it positively so that we can be a good mentor for our students regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, et cetera. But so I'm going to tell you some interesting story during my 30 years of mentoring uh, majority students and mentoring minority students and want to share with you some of my observations and, and also show you how you don't have to be afraid of it, but you should embrace it, but you should still stretch every single one of your students. Doesn't matter if they're white, or they're African American, or they're Hispanic, or they're, they're Asian. But if you really worry about it too much, then you may not be able to take some risk in mentoring your students, okay? So I'm, so I'm gonna talk to you about, first will be, I would imagine a lot of you guys would end up being a professor, so that will be my bias. Uh, but uh, my other stories could help you too, even if you don't want to be a professor, okay? So basically, the fact that you're going to want a PhD, many of you guys may go for a, a academic path. Uh, and the academic path is somewhat simple, basically. Uh, uh, after you finish your degree, you want to get a teaching job, okay? And, <laughs> and there are actually all kinds of things that you need to know uh, in order to get a good teaching job. The problem will be a lot of you guys are so busy in studying that you do not think about the target behavior when you are at the fifth year or the fourth year. And so you kind of let it happen, okay? Trust me, things don't happen randomly, okay? So therefore, if you start looking at what will be the target behavior in year five when you start looking for a job, then you can prepare for it. Now, if you do not look at the target behavior, you just let things happen, okay? By the time you go to year five and you want to make some behavior change, it's too late, 
right? Because you cannot make things change so quickly. So knowing what is the target behavior that you need to have at year five or year six, if we like you so much, maybe year seven, we won't let you, go, let you get out. So don't be too smart, okay? Uh, if you are very difficult, I'll let you out in three years. Boom, you got it, okay? <laughs> but anyway, so look at what will be the target behavior. The target behavior at the end of the uh, uh, journey will be you want to either get a postdoc or you want to go get a teaching job. Okay, so let's skip the postdoc because the postdoc is just a, another step of postponing being a professor. Okay, so at the end, <laughs> being a professor requires that you have to go for a job interview. Okay, and professor interview is different than other interviews. Professor interview tend to be two days, sometimes three days. Okay, and before you can get a campus interview, you need to have a phone interview. I like telephone interview. Back then, there's no Skype, okay? So in telephone interview, what do I do? I anticipate all the questions. I write it on a piece of paper. When <laughs> it's on the phone, they don't know I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, but now you guys cannot do it. They do Skype interview, okay? And, and so that's why it's beautiful for me. I'm 58 years old. I don't have to deal with the technology anymore. <laughs> but you guys would have to do it, okay? So basically, what do we look for as an employer when we hire you, okay? We basically, a, a group of professors hiring a brand new professors are actually somewhat conservative. So they are almost like a company, uh, uh, they are almost like project managers or human resources managers. When they hire people, they basically want to know one thing, okay? Especially when the economies always go up and down, okay? If I'm gonna hire an assistant professor, I need to make sure that assistant professor will make tenure. The reason is I don't want to take any risk if you fail, that year, the economy is no good. The dean may take away that position from me. You see the problem, okay? So when I hire someone, I pay a lot of attention to whether you can make tenure, okay? So it's your job to demonstrate to me that you can make tenure. That means you can be promoted to associate professor seven years later, okay? Remember, we have only three rank. Assistant professor, associate, and that's, we give you seven years, okay? And actually, you don't have the whole seven years. At the six years, you go up. And if you don't get it, we give you the seven year to look for a job, okay? So basically, uh, <laughs> so assistant professor track actually has only seven years, but it has only six years of real years, okay? And the first year is so difficult. You go into a new place, you try to assimilate, you try to settle down. You think you will be doing a lot of research? Not quite, okay? So therefore, the first year, you're gonna learn how to teach and all those kind of things. So you have only about five years window to do a lot of good research to get tenure, okay? So therefore, you have to learn all kind of things before you get there. You don't want to say, well, I want to learn to be a professor when, by the time I get there. You cannot do that, okay? Second thing will be, Professor is a very interesting pro profession. Uh, luckily, you guys are in education, but professors, we never need to take a single class in teaching. Interesting, right? And you, never, you may have never taught a whole semester of classes if you are not a lecturer at your fourth year, okay? So therefore, fight with your classmate to get the lecturership, okay? And, but you still love each other, okay? Uh, it's not cutthroat, okay? <laughs> but, but anyway, we have to actually, once they hire us, automatically, our IQ go up 20 points. We know how to teach three classes. Wait a minute, never taught three classes. How come my IQ suddenly go up three po uh, 20 points? Therefore, it will not happen. So you would want to make use of every of your appointments to prepare yourself so that by the time you get ready to go for a job interview, you can tell people that I have research experience, I have teaching experience, and I also have some leadership type experience, okay? And if you can tell people that, what would, what would I feel as an employer? I feel better because I think you already know the 
attitude. You already have the attitudes, right? You can tell me concretely what you have done to prepare yourself to be a professor. And also, you know our kindergarten rules, OK? And that's very important. Every kindergarten has its own rules, right? And if you go to my kindergarten and you already show me that you know all the rules, I feel good, OK? <laughs> then I know I can train you. I can mentor you. I can get you from point A to point B, OK? And therefore, if you already use your year one to know what you need to know, every year you can increase, improve a little bit, build your CV, OK? Don't build your CV at year four. It's too late. You cannot build your CV at year four, OK? You build your CV from year one, OK? And therefore, if you do that, you have a much better chance. And you make you a much better TA, make, make you a much better project assistant, make you a much better research assistant because you, have, you can see the benefits of being the best assistant that you can be. Okay? It's a mutual benef benefit. Okay? Observe your supervisors. How do they uh, work with the outside world? Uh, and professors, by the time you guys become professors, it's actually very much a business model. Okay, I hate to tell you the truth, okay? Because when I started, I thought I will be poor forever. Okay, uh, my, uh, when I, uh, my parents are refugees from China. Uh, in 1949, when the communists took over, my parents lost everything. And uh, we moved to Hong Kong, which is a British colony at that time. And so we were refugees uh, uh, in Hong Kong. We, we live in a refugee camp. And so I hang out with poor people. So actually, at that time, my goal will be whatever job will that will make me poor, that's my goal. Okay? So my first uh, vocational goal is to be a Catholic priest. And we'll, we'll, I want to actually be a Catholic uh, priest that works in a, the most poorest parish. Okay, that's what I want, okay? And uh, sort of that, then I want to be a social worker so that I can still be poor, okay? Sort of that, I want to be working with people with disabilities so that I can be poor. So when I married my wife, I said, I have some news for you, okay? It will be whatever job that will make me poor, uh, I do, okay? <laughs> but if you're rich, that's fine too, okay? <laughs> but she's a lot more richer than I am. <laughs> but anyway, so... But basically, therefore, when I go into my PhD, I still want to be very poor. So actually, uh, uh, my, my major is rehabilitation psychology, and I want to be a psychologist. Okay? And so I know when I become a professor, it will be a, a, a very humble life. right? But my first job is at, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas. It's in a medical school. Medical school wants you to self-finance. Teaching at the medical school is somewhat a privilege. You better bring in the money to pay for your own salary. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> so then I finally learned to be, oh, even teaching is actually somewhat a business model. Okay? And now in the newer world with the economy going this way, trust me, learn it from me now and believe that first, okay? that even in a comprehensive university, there's some expectation that this is a business model that it's good that you can self-finance some portion of your salary. And how do you self-finance your, your salary? Will be you better have some grants, OK? And that's why promotion and tenure do expect some kind of research grants, OK? So that's just the basic uh, way that to look at will be for being a professor nowadays, it's a little bit more demanding, OK? Uh, and you guys might be able to uh, adjust better will be if you think about it like that now, OK? So now I'm ready to go back to walk you guys through the strategies for each job that you have, OK? So I'm going to teach you about the research assistantship first, and then I'm going to talk to you about maybe the project assistantship and the teaching assistantship, OK? So hopefully, during your three years, four years here, you may want to rotate out. Okay? And not just doing teaching assistantship, but hopefully we will rotate to a research assistantship also. Okay? Uh, and so if you are a person who are more research oriented, you still want to go look for a teaching assistantship. Okay? So that your CV will become what? Become very balanced. Okay? So the key is to have a balanced CV when you go to job interview. That you demonstrate that you know how to teach. You also demonstrate that you would also know how to do research. Okay? So when you apply for a a teaching job, an academic job, okay? The first thing that they want you to do will be, of course, a cover letter. That, you know, that's very strictly, relatively straightforward, okay? Then the second thing will be they want you to have a teaching uh, philosophy, usually about one page, okay? 
Then they also want you to have a research statement, okay? What may be your programmatic research in the future, okay? So start thinking about those are the basic things that are being required of you when you go look for a job, okay? Now then you can start preparing for it, okay? So how many of you guys already have a good idea of about your teaching philosophy? Okay, so that's good because you guys are teachers, okay? But, you know, maybe four years later, you may have somewhat different, hopefully somewhat teaching philosophy too, because you should learn something new in these four years, okay? All right? So, so the first thing that I would want to talk about will be, uh, let's talk about teaching philosophy, okay? And so in your, uh, in your when you start writing your teaching philosophy, uh, you should start looking at it now, will be then you can start practicing it, modifying it, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And when you go for an interview, people do ask you about that too. What will be your teaching philosophy, okay? So what's my teaching philosophy? Well, I have some of the new doctoral students from, from my program here too, so I better be careful, okay? <laughs> my teaching philosophy is very simple, okay? Uh, because I come from a rehabilitation background, okay? And rehabilitation and special education, our philosophy is inclusion, that, that we believe that everyone can be taught, okay? So we have a more inclusion philosophy. And that's very similar to Confucius. And actually Confucius also said everyone can be taught. Okay, except, the, except that he qualified, okay? So if you think everyone can be taught, yes, it's easy to say that, okay? What Confucius qualified will be, if you want to do that, then you have to customize it, okay? So it's easy to say that everyone can be taught, uh, but in order to do it right, you have to somewhat customize it, okay? So to customize it becomes very difficult because you would have to know your students enough to customize it. Okay. For example, if a person with a, a, a very oversensitive to criticism, and you want to push that person, well, if you don't have enough your relationship with that person, you cannot stretch that person yet. Okay. Some people like me, you know, I, I'm kind of immune because I'm I don't know. You know, when you are saying something negative about me, I don't even know, okay? So I'm not that sensitive, okay? So you can stretch me any way you want it, okay? But so you have to know everyone very carefully before you can apply whatever stretching rule that you want to stretch. That requires that you take the time to understand every human being's behavior. Okay, what's their strengths? What's their limitation? What can I do to change what? Okay, and so I always tell my first year student, this uh, doctoral student, okay, if you leave Wisconsin, okay, getting better at what you're already good at, I fail. Okay, that's good to, to do better than what you're already good at. You want to leave Wisconsin doing this, better at what you're already good at, but better at what you're already, also better at what you're not good at. Okay, that's, that's the whole idea of teaching. It will be, you know, it's easy to focus on your natural talent. You already have it, okay? Coming through these four years, I give you a structure, and you will then further develop it. Then you cheat it yourself, because there are other things that you have not done, okay? So go with, so my teaching philosophy is, is pain. I like people suffer, okay? Pain is good, okay? So we'll be, you know, you got to live here knowing things that you're not good at coming in, but you live here better at what you're not, not good at, okay? Then you gain, now you're more wounded, okay? So that's actually somewhat my teaching philosophy. It's actually, you know, if you, if you think too quick, I want you to think slower. If you think too slow, I want you to think quicker. If you walk too fast, I want you to walk slow. If you're too khaki, I want you to be humble. If you're too humble, I want you to be khaki, okay? Within acceptable range, okay? So, <laughs> but that's what you want to do, okay? There are two things uh, when you come to this program. will be, you know, uh, in my last uh, sabbatical, 2002, I actually went to film school to learn how to make films. Uh, they didn't let me, so that's the beauty of being a professor. Uh, I, my argument with the dean was that if you look at Professor Mick instructional film, what do they do? The camera never moves, right? And so all the students look at the film, it's like, oh, this is so stupid, right? <laughs> camera go this way, camera go that way, that way, that way, right? And then they all start looking at the telephone, right? So I told, <laughs> I, I told the dean, I said, the new world is going to be visual, 
Okay, I need to go to film school to make film so that I can come back and make instructional film that's not this way. Okay, <laughs> and, and indeed, actually, I've been making films that are actually, I have professional film crews that allow me to uh, learn how to make films in a more interesting way, right? <laughs> and so basically, that year, I was, uh, uh, my classmates are 20 some years old, blue hair, green hair, purple hair, and so actually, it allowed me to go back to become more close to you guys to understand your suffering because I was a student again uh, in 2002 and my professors don't give me any break, right? Just because I'm older, okay? Uh, so I learned a lot about being a student again, being, uh, so that means I regained somewhat of my sensitivity. And so I know what you guys are going through and therefore I kind of want to show you guys that you have to have a goal, okay? And then once you have a goal, then you can keep your eyes on the ball. Right? And once you can keep your eyes on the ball, you can develop okay, strategies. Okay? Once you can develop strategies, you can get there. Okay? Then after that, you have to make good decisions. Okay? And in life, that's it. If you have those four things, you're pretty much okay. okay? So my teaching philosophy tend to be deal with actually life and uh, along with our, our uh, studying area plus making you a more rounded as a person. If you're a more rounded person, when you go for interview, people know, okay? If you're very, very tight, okay, and put, put everything like this, and just a take person, people know, okay? And if you are a give and take person, your, for, for, uh, your career will go a lot further, okay? You cannot not put money in the bank and always want to take money out, okay? And when you start working with your classmates, some people are like that. Okay, that person is not going to be your lifelong collaborator because that will be like Charlie Brown, okay? That every time I go cake and that person take that away from me, okay? So this is, these four years allow you to find out who you can work with, okay? Who will be your collaborator for the rest of your life. Being a professor is a somewhat lonely journey. You want to have two, three people that you can work the rest of your life. I still publish with my classmates 30 years later. Okay, and so those are the interesting things that you want to look at. Will be if this person cannot give and take with you, that person is not in your group. Okay, now that person can maybe can do give and take with another group, so that's that's okay. But you already know this person is not with you. Okay, and so that you could develop a good team that you can work with the rest of your life. Okay, and so that kind of teaching philosophy allow me to teach you about. Uh, how you can be more successful in your career will be by being more generous, give and take, okay? But that has to qualify, okay? When I work with people, I do not look at a one-on-one -on -one return, okay? You have to look at individual differences. Some people can give more because they are, they are faster, okay? Some people can work only at certain uh, capacity. So you have to work with people in terms of what they can give you, okay? But if they give me what they can give me already, even though it's less, I can live with that, okay? But some people can give you more, but they give you less. I cannot live with that, okay? <laughs> so you have to adjust who you can work with by giving them a break, Ruby. They give me what they can give me. Uh, now I'm okay, that's fair, okay? And so in terms of teaching, I allow my students to try all kinds of things with, my, uh, with all the groups so that they can learn this, okay? Now the second thing will be you have to look at then within the classroom, in that more diverse classroom, how do you then handle diversity? So I need to tell you one more story, okay? So, and they're now all prof full professors. They're now in their 40s. In the 90s, I have a group of interesting students, okay? My field, rehabilitation psychology, in the 90s, start switching to more female-dominated field. In the 70s and in the 80s, it's a predominantly man-dominated field, okay? And so most of the professors in the 90s will be white, white men professors because they hired them in the 70s. But the student base changed to more woman base, okay? And so I have, uh, um, I have a rainbow type students coming in, okay? And so two years later, and I, I don't go home usually. Um, uh, so Wednesday night, they know that I will be in my office. And they will trickle in and kind of BS with me about life in general a little bit, OK? So one, one, one night, the white uh, male doctoral student came in, OK? And the white male student come in and say, 
Fong, I don't think I will ever find a job. I said, how so? Because I'm a counselor, I usually validate, okay? Uh, because validation is a good thing, trust me, okay? Try that with your boyfriends and girlfriends, okay? Always validate, okay? So I validate, I listen, and all those kind of things, okay? And so he said, well, you see the field is changing, okay? It used to, used to be dominated by white men professors, and now the, the field is changed to all women professors, uh, I mean women uh, counselors, and the students are also women, right? And therefore, whenever there's a white man professor retire, they're probably going to hire a woman or a minority. So that's his reality. There's some truth to it, right? So most people's worldview, trust me, has some degree of truth to it, okay? It just depends on how they use it, okay? So then uh, I listen, I make him feel good, I do not make any judgment yet, I will, okay? Uh, uh, then uh, the, uh, the next day, the next night, the white woman student come in, okay? And the white woman student come in and say, Fong, you never find a job, okay? I said, how so, okay? Well, the field is being dominated by white men, okay? Now, there's a lot of truth to that, because at that time, the field is dominated by white men, okay? Uh, and so then she talked to me about her concern and how this is uncontrollable, this is hopeless, okay? And I listen, I make her feel good and all that. So she leave feeling better because I validate, okay? So then the black man come in, okay? And say, I'll never find a job because the world is just for white men and white women, okay? And she, he will tell me why this is actually uh, untenable, you know, and, and, he, and his world will is absolutely true, and there's no way around it, okay? And of course, then I have an international student come in, and, 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 and he's Asian, he, and he said, I think I want to stay here, but who would hire me? They're going to hire a white man, a white woman, a black man, a black woman, a Hispanic man, a Hispanic woman, before they hire me, okay? So I validate that and all that, I hear you, I feel your pain and all those kind of things, okay? <laughs> so then the next week, the black man come back and sing the same song. Now I already validate him, right? Okay. So basically then the next week I cannot validate him in some way. Okay. So basically what I told him will be this. I said, looks like this situation is not tenable, right? And he said, yes. I said, then why are you continuing your program? You may as well just quit. Because two more years later you will not have a job anyway. Why don't you just quit now and just save, your all, save yourself all those agony? Make sense? Because it's untenable, okay? Okay, then the person's like, wow, this is not a psychologist, he's not listening. So, so he's mad at me, okay? <laughs> so then the white woman come in and I, I say the same thing. The situation is not tenable, right? You might as well quit to save yourself some hassle, right? So I, talk, I tell that to the black man, tell that to the international student, okay? So then my chair comes to me, Fong, what did you do? Now everyone wants to quit. <laughs> 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 So, so the story is this. The third week when they come, I will tell them this, okay? I totally understand your perspective, okay? There's a lot of truth to that, okay? But you only think about it like this way, those are the uncontrollables. If you only focus on the uncontrollable, your own uncontrollable, okay? To me, may not be uncontrollable, but it's your uncontrollable. The problem with you using only your uncontrollable will be this. If you fail, you cannot self-correct. Because all you need then to do will be focus on the uncontrollable. Right? You may fail will be because you're no good. Right? So there's two things. One will be you cannot focus on the uncontrollable. Okay? Second, you should not be not aware of the uncontrollable. You should be aware of it. I'm not saying that you are not right. Okay? You should be aware of it. But if that's the only thing that you're focusing on, then it's un untenable. There's no hope. Might as well don't go, go for anything. Okay? But if you agree that, okay, that is something that I, the uncontrollable is the elephant in the room, I should be aware of that, then the next thing you want to think about will be, how, what, what can I do about it? Okay? So what can you do about it is the controllable. Okay. The controllable will be, I can be a better presenter, I can have a better CV, I can have more research, I can be a better interviewer, right? I can be a strong competitor. That allows you to have hope. If you have no hope, you cannot go any further. Okay? Now I can stretch you. I can stretch you because we all make the elephant in the room explicit. 
and they know that I, I acknowledge, I validate that elephant in the room for each one of you. We all have our own elephant in the room, okay? And I, I, I agree that's the elephant in the, in the room for you, okay? Now then I can move forward to say, how can I help you to go with the controllables, okay? And how can we make the controllables offset some of the uncontrollables? Now you have a direction, you have strategy, okay? We all have an elephant in the room that we believe, okay? But we cannot let the elephant in the room that allow me to use every excuse to go to that elephant, okay? Will be, this way if I do not get a job, I can be more objectively evaluate why I am not getting a job, why I'm not losing to that person. Will be maybe because there's certain things I'm not doing it right, right? So, that's what you want to teach also in a more diverse world. We allow people to make the elephant explicit, but also be willing to accept that their elephant has a lot of truth to it. Then based on that elephant, how can we work together to make sure everyone can improve, right? Then they can compete with each other by parceling out the elephant, okay? Because then I, I make the group together, go together. I said, when you make the elephant all elevated to all important. Now it's not fair to your classmate because if your classmate get job A and you lose to your classmate, then you will not be willing to congratulate your classmate because you think it's because of the elephant, right? Now, but if you make the elephant explicit, we can then say he get the job or she get the job will be because he or she is the best fit for that position. Not because they're better, but they are better fit for that position, okay? And then when you get a job, they will have to say that you are better fit for that position, okay? Then everyone can be able to congratulate each other based on what they are doing well on that position, okay? And trust me, they all end up being professors. And they now all mid-career professors, full professors, Okay, and whenever we go to conference, they all have to buy me a drink because I sold them <laughs> a different way. So I'm always a drunk in conferences. Because, <laughs> not because I'm a drunk, but they, what can I do? They want to show their appreciation, okay? So, so, <laughs> so teaching is an interesting thing, okay? Teaching, if you want to stretch, you got to be almost like a psychologist, that you have to have empathy. You have to be able to say, I can see your perspective. Doesn't mean I have to agree with your perspective. And within that empathy, I also have a way to work with you, will be what we call working alliance. And you'd be surprised. In counseling uh, therapy, what we're focusing on a lot of the time is actually expectations and behavior change. And expectations is very important to behavior change. And when we can work with people based on some three things, actually be surprised, okay? If we can come up with commonly agree upon goals, that means me and my student or me and my client commonly agree upon goals. And we can come up with commonly agree upon tasks that can allow them to achieve that goal. And if we have bonding that they that we like each other, that we know that we can work together. We have this special relationship. That three things together tend to predict whether I will be successful in counseling psychotherapy outcome. Can you believe that? It's just that simple, okay? And of course, we, we make our student go through five years of program to learn that, but there's only three things, okay? <laughs> and then I love you, man, we'll take care of everything, okay? <laughs> but, but, in teaching, it's the same thing, okay? When you go on to a mentoring process, that's what you want to do. If you can develop a good working relationship with your student and you really have their best interest in mind, that's what would happen, okay? So mentoring requires that you really pay some, you have to like your student. You have to like your student enough to know what's their strengths, what's their limitations, and you want to play with their psyche, okay? It will be you want them to change the bad one. Okay, the, or the one that can be improved, okay? And I like it, it's almost like a chess game to me, okay? It's like, hey, what button can I push? But the thing is, actually, I want to stretch, okay? And if you don't stretch, not stretching your student is the safest way. You'll never get into any trouble. No one's going to run down to the dean's office and complain about you not being sensitive, okay? So, but I think, you know, the fact that we become a teacher will be we want to change behavior. 
And so you want to make some changes, right? You, in that case, you want to take some risk, okay? Now, therefore, if it requires you to understand different cultural behavior, I think then you should know it, okay? You should try to understand a lot of cultural behaviors, okay? But the only problem will be there's no uh, a fixed formula for it. Say, for example, you know, if you look at, say, Chinese, well, there's, there should be Chinese psychology. You know, we share some common things. But it's all Chinese alike? Definitely not, right? And so, therefore, if you, can, if you want to really, really want to make it micro, then you can say that you cannot work with people if you do not know every person's culture, right? Because every person has their own culture, right? So you have to trust yourself that that you do need to know the culture. After that, you still have to look at the individual differences. And the individual differences require that you work with people on a pairwise basis. Every pair has some idiosyncrasy that's different. So what you want to be, that you need to have this interest in knowing everyone at a pairwise basis, okay? Culture is only one factor. There are many other factors, okay? Personality is one. Their background is one. Socioeconomic status is one. It's not just culture. There are multiple things. So when you want to work with successfully with your clients or your students, look at each one as an individual pair, okay? And start from there, okay? The more you understand psychology, the more you understand human behavior, of course, that's better. Okay, so that's one part that, that I usually use as my teaching philosophy, okay? Now in the interview, you have to condense it to about two minutes, okay? Because otherwise, you say, wow, this guy's too talkative, okay? But I become a professor because I'm very talkative anyway. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk to you about will be research, okay? Now, some students will start out as a research assistant. They're lucky will be, at least from the publication part of it, okay? Will be, the more publications you have before you get out, the better, okay? And so the first thing you want to understand is not how many publications. It's by doing publications, you will learn one thing, okay? For example, uh, is there any people who are a counseling psychology major? Okay? The Journal of Counseling Psychology has a 90, close to 90% rejection rate. So what you want to learn initially is what? To be not crying. <laughs> it's like, 10 people go in, I get rejected, okay? It's not like they don't spend a lot of time doing that. So when you do that in the first year as a research assistant, you will begin to develop a thick skin, okay? Will be, first of all, you're not gonna submit this paper as a first author anyway. Basically, you're gonna submit this paper by helping your major professors or a fifth year doctoral student, okay? So first of all, it's already shelter you from that direct, attack on your, on, your, on your inner strength, okay? And because you can bring it on your major professor, okay? So, but you want to try it, right? You start writing with your professor. You submit to Journal of Counseling Psychology. You come back with very nasty review. Well, you could bring it on your major professor, but, but you still will feel bad about it. It'll be because, wow, that's tough. But not only that, the reviewers are usually very smart. So when they tear your paper apart, they give you very good suggestions. And you learn, wow, you can never have perfect papers because people are so smart, okay? It humbles you, right? And so my students still work with me now. I, I'm a professor 30 years. I have about 250 publications. When they work with me, every time when we submit something, there's still a nasty review coming back, okay? So it allows them to feel really good. They'll be, wow, Fong is so stupid, okay? <laughs> Now I can fix the problem so you will get problems, but it allow them to have a more realistic understanding of how this works, okay? So how do I do my research program? I'm a director of the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Evidence-Based Practice. That's my grant, okay? My grant's about a million bucks a year, five years, from uh, the National Institute on Disability and Rehab Research. So I probably know a little bit about grant, okay? Uh, so I usually do it this way. Uh, I have students from year one, two, three, and four, right? So year four people will usually will be the leader. And I will give that person a project and say, go, f go find your own people, year three, year two, year one, okay? And uh, then you know, I will then set up the project for the year four people to lead the year three, two, and one, okay? But what I want that student to learn will be, if later on I find out that you do everything yourself, that means you do not know how to supervise. Okay? You're going back to be as low as the year one. 
because not only I want you to so that you know what to do, but I also want you to know how to lead. Okay, so the year four people would all know that they are going to lose their job if they don't lead. Okay, so then they will make sure the year three, two, one people contribute. Okay, so therefore no one will have a free ride. Okay, as long as everyone contributes, then that year four people will keep to be the leader. Okay, what's the benefit of the being the leader? They can be either the senior offer, or if I'm the senior offer, the person will be the second offer. Okay, and the year one person will be what? The last offer, right? It's fair because they're going to do less. They don't know as much yet. Okay, so by doing that. They will start learning research from the beginning to an end. They also know how to do submit, how to submit papers, how do, how do I revise it, and how many times I revise it. Sometimes paper will have to revise two times, three times, four times. Okay? So how do, how do the journal come back and tell you? The, the journal will come back with different category. The first category, this, this paper is so stupid. Okay? <laughs> we are rejecting it, and I don't think it will publish in any journal in this world, that category. Now, that, if I have that, I'm not, then I should not have my job. We'll never get that because I'm past that, okay? You guys could, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the second one will be, we're rejecting it, but it's not that bad. There may be a lesser journal you can try, okay? So they're trying to help you out, okay? The next one will be, well, I cannot take it. It's just not good enough. But if you totally rewrite it and totally reanalyze it, you can be submitted as a new submission. We can think about that, okay? <laughs> then I'm already kind of feel good, okay? <laughs> See? Okay. So, I, and I'm a devout Catholic. Now, that will not require me to go to Wednesday night uh, 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 mass yet, because it's still a rejection, okay? Now, the next one will be major, uh, except with major revision. Wednesday night mass, okay? Go to, thank God. How do I get so lucky, man, okay? <laughs> so, then the next one will be, except with minor revision, seldom happen. Once in a while, you get lucky. Now I go to Wednesday night mass and Saturday night mass and Sunday morning mass. God, you are just so kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> Except if that revision never happened, trust me. <laughs> okay. So those are the things that you guys would start learning, right? Not only that, will be if you start doing this kind of thing, your major professor with money, what do they do? They will then take you to conferences. And now you will be making presentations, okay? And so most data set can have big papers or smaller papers. And the professor may give you a smaller piece of it that you are the senior author of it, and you will do a poster session. Poster session, when you go to, when you travel in the airline and you see some young people with a tube like that, they're carrying it, okay? You never see me do it because I don't do poster session, okay? But you guys did, okay? But anyway, so now you start doing poster session, okay? Carrying that tube, okay? Walking around with, the, with your poster, okay? Now, then after a while, you start getting a hang of it. Before you get out, you probably do a, what we call a presentation. Now you got to talk. Okay, there's no more to, okay? You go in with your PowerPoint, fly through it with all the fancy Greek symbols and all those. By the time four years, it will be automatic for you guys, okay? Uh, alpha, beta, delta, whatever, you guys know everything about it, okay? So now, you would then have everything covered, right? You teach enough classes, you have a teaching philosophy, you're beginning to build programmatic research, you have publications, and you have presentations. Right? And this is what you would get if you start from year one, knowing this is not just a job. This is something that is actually you should value. You should say, thank God, how come I get so lucky to get this low pay job, right? <laughs> because, because there's other reasons for it, okay? The other reason is to make sure that you have all this opportunity to prepare your CV, okay? So now you hear from me will be, Therefore, it's not random. You start from year one because you know what's the target behavior, okay? And once you know the target behavior, you now can have a pathway to get there. And I will make use of every one of my appointments to help me achieve as one of my, some of my pathways to achieve my goal, okay? So I think you guys are great, and hopefully you will have another four or five years to practice those uh, uh, behavior that you need to have as a professor, and, uh, and I can see that you guys are going to have another 40 years of uh, uh, happy and successful career as an academician. I won't be able to see it. I'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> but 
uh, uh, so I'm glad that I have this opportunity to share some of my uh, process with you. I have a quick 30 years of career. I love it. You can not, you can never find a better job. Trust me. Okay, and uh, so if you think about like me, I always told my wife, and I have to, I have to say it that way though. Okay, I told my wife. I said, in my life, I only make two great decisions. Okay, one, I came to Wisconsin for my PhD. Second, I married you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that dumb, right? <laughs> <laughs> But that's true. So I make two great decisions in my life, right? And actually served me quite well. And you guys already make one great decision. And, uh, and Wisconsin, I cannot, you know, you guys make a great decision. This is a great place to get your PhD, OK? Uh, OK, I'm going to let you guys out. And thanks for uh, 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 inviting me to share some of my experience with you.